So this is uh, this is a, a major effort. As you recall, when we approved Plan Area 2013, there were several questions we were barely recovering in terms of our economy, uh, our job growth. Uh, there were several questions of our economy, our jobs, our businesses, and there was a strong request that we needed to address that more specifically. That while housing is a pressing issue, we also need to understand the uh, the dynamics of our economy. So. Uh, Michael Weinberg at the Bay Area Council Economic Institute stepped in to work on this on this document, which compiles the perspective from the business community, and it's an effort to try to get their perspective into Plan Bay Area. Um, Jeff Belisari is also here with us from the same team. Uh, Michael joined uh, the Bay Area Council Economic Institute less than a year ago, and. Uh, he's brought a lot of energy, a, a, a lot of uh, strategic approaches to deal with this, with the questions that the business uh, community is is dealing with. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, uh, the Bay Area Council Economic Institute is the independent research arm of the Bay Area Council, which is uh, an organization of about 300 large employers in the Nine County Bay Area. Um, the Economic Institute is governed by a cross-sector board of trustees, though. Uh, which include uh, Pierce, uh, Jerry Madsen, Ezra, and others. Um, what we were doing here, though, as Miriam said, is really you know, not just going back into our little rooms and uh, thinking our best thoughts about this, but holding a bunch of meetings with leaders of the business community to provide their input into Plan Mayor. So I uh, personally agree with most of the recommendations, but that's not really my job here today. My job here is to deliver a report on a uh, set of perspectives that uh, the regional agencies uh, thought were important for Plan Bay Area and uh, be carried forward uh, by those uh, uh, business leaders in uh, different advocacy activities that they'll be engaging in uh, coming out of this, not just related to Plan Bay Area specifically, but broader legislative advocacy and, and other issues. But um, we have a little bit of time, but I really want to make a few framing remarks. And that is that California has the highest rate of poverty in the nation. I mean, we've heard that before, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's really sunk in, <laughs> at least for me. And the California Legislative Analyst Office is among those that have pointed out that the cost of housing is the primary driver of poverty in the state, and the higher cost of housing is caused by undersupply, period. Policies that constrain the production of housing may be temporarily in the interest of certain communities. These policies mostly benefit higher income communities but they sometimes tempo temporarily benefit lower income communities. However, on a systematic level, any policies that constrain the supply of housing work to keep the poverty rate in our state high and therefore work against the interest of our state's low income residents. So this is what we're talking about. If we're talking about building more housing, better transportation to connect it, better uh, education for folks that are gonna have these jobs, it's a critical social equity issue, but also a, a critical business issue. And I, I liked the part of the conversation earlier that it actually our, our inability for various different reasons to build housing has actually gotten to the point where folks think it is a drag on the nation's economic growth. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and the other thing to say here though is that the housing affordability and housing supply are at a crisis level, but this isn't because of a recent rapid rate of economic and job growth. It's a crisis point that we're at because of a generation of underbuilding. Since the 1970s, we're more than a million units short in the greater Bay Area alone. This report does not propose to blame any particular actor for the situation. We all share in the blame to some extent. In fact, I almost don't want to say a lot of the times that the Bay Area Council has been working on housing policy for 70 years, because it sort of leads to the question, so why haven't you guys fixed it by now? Um, it's, a, it's something we're all going to work, have to work on collectively, and I, I think there's a, a greater understanding that we have to get more serious about producing housing in the Bay Area, and there are a lot of uh, things that stand in that way. So as I mentioned, this is uh, intended to provide an input into uh, Plan Bay Area, um, and uh, it was funded by MTC and uh, supported by AVAC. Hello, Therese, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'm going to move through the recommendations really quickly because I'd love to have at least some time for conversation. So uh, on the, the housing supply side, um, the, you know, one of the questions is what happens when uh, communities do 
not uh, build the amount of housing that uh, they, the region needs them to build, that their neighbors need them to build, that the children of the people who live in their communities need them to build, that lower income residents need them to build. Well, uh, if we propose a number of uh, potential ways of holding these lo local communities accountable. Um, this includes by right zoning districts, uh, regional hearing body uh, to uh, hear appeals on housing. Uh, but there are also other more incremental solutions that are uh, available here. And one of them is uh, doing a lot more on accessory dwelling units. And that's actually going to be a big initiative of ours here over the course of the next year. Um, and some regional cities have actually done some great stuff on accessory dwelling units. Um, and uh, increasing the, the density of housing within priority development areas is something we're very supportive of. And so uh, we want to see this housing supply expand, but there are lots of different tools to expand that supply of housing, and ADUs are one of them. And then, of course, there's uh, changing the broader tax policy that puts us all in this bad situation where we're financially disincented to produce housing. Um, and uh, there are, that's probably a longer term public education uh, process on you know, changing Prop 13, essentially, and the way we distribute uh, property tax across cities. That said, that, that's the original sin, right? I mean, that's the, th the thing that has got us in this uh, situation more than anything else, and it's the thing that we need to think about if we actually want to really deal with it in a serious way. Um, I mean, th this is, you know, gets into the uh, issue of things that restrict the supply of housing, Obviously, impact fees through taxing housing will cause you to have less housing. Uh, there's uh, CEQA, and there's also opportunities to streamline the approvals and essentially bring down the cost of housing, leverage new building technologies, and so on. We also look at a number of other areas in the report um, because really you can't think about housing without thinking about transportation and vice versa. And unfortunately, uh, our, our friends in the federal government are not helping us out very much in the transportation arena. Um, federal transportation funding and infrastructure funding generally has, has really fallen off a cliff. And the solutions that we're left with, uh, sort of local health solutions, are, are really not good ones. Um, and uh, the, the local self-help measures are, um, are what they are, and we think we need to look at a number of different things including creating an empowered regional agency to fund infrastructure projects, uh, give it more ability to, to raise funding. And it isn't just about the amount of funding you come up with. There are lots of solutions in this report to drive the efficiency of project delivery, as well as uh, coming up with funds to support it. Um, and there are traditional and alternative finance sources. Uh, the council for years and my uh, colleague, Sean Randolph, has been working on public-private partnerships, but the, uh, whether it's traditional finance or alternative finance, we need some finance. Um, and we believe that this finance needs to come primarily, uh, needs to be coming from the regional level and going towards regional priority pro projects. There's plenty of opportunities though to use the existing system better. Um, and. Uh, this would involve aligning the regional 26 agencies. So in, in my position, I, I often get, you know, I get calls from people um, from around the world and uh, they say, oh, you know, man, the Bay Area is doing so well. You know about Bay Area government, right? Uh, tell me exactly how Bay Area does government and we'll set up our government to be just like the Bay Area's government <laughs> so that we'll get, you know, the great economic outcomes that you guys are getting. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. Take your single regional transportation agency and break it up into 26. No, I mean, the, the truth is that we can do more to uh, drive efficiency within our system. Um, we need to do more. We already are doing more. We need to build on uh, investing in transportation corridors uh, rather than sort of locally, uh, you know, transportation areas defined by, uh, you know, particular uh, geographic boundaries. Um, you know, the, the transportation corridors that are just getting, you might as well just walk over the Altamont Pass at this point. Um, also 101 south of San Jose and 80 is always uh, good times. Um, and so looking at those corridors and planning for those corridors that stretch across uh, many different uh, jurisdictions is something that there's some good uh, energy behind already. We also think that we need to incentivize the use of the latest technology. I mean, it's really, 
you know, uh, amazing to me were this, again, we're the center of the innovation economy, everyone who wants to hear about how amazing we are, but we really don't leverage our um, sort of smart grid type technologies to make our transportation systems as efficient as they, they can be. We can do a lot more uh, with, the, with the roads and transportation systems that we, we currently have. And like with the housing projections, we're not doing that through lack of technology. We're not doing that because it's impossible to do. We're doing that because of the political environment and a series of political and policy decisions that have been made that make even just metering uh, the entrance to freeways a gigantic issue when there's no real technological issue that stands in the way of our community. Um, you heard about this some in Cynthia's absolutely fantastic presentation that really teed this up really, really well. Um, but there's a huge skill gap uh, in California and that's due to the fact that, as she, she showed, most of the job growth going forward is going to be in these higher skilled areas of, uh, of healthcare and, and IT. Um, and so we need to really be investing in a much more serious way in our, uh, in our human capital here in the Bay Area. And shocker, the Bay Area Council thinks it should be done on a regional level. Um, but it's not just us. The economies are not organized on the local level. Economies, uh, the workforce, the, uh, economic opportunity is organized on a regional level. Um, and so there's been a lot of great uh, uh, momentum recently around getting the community colleges together and coordinating more regionally. The uh, workforce funding is now flowing uh, somewhat more regionally. And we think there needs to be more of that. And we're actually stepping up and playing a significant role in getting better information from the regional employer community to the, uh, the regional uh, training community. And so here's the, the last uh, slide. Um, you know, essentially, we're a region we need to start acting like one. So one of the things that we noticed is that, um, so I actually got a call the other day, um, and we ended up doing a project for a new business that was uh, wanting to site in a part of the region, and they wanted to know well, where's your uh, regional economic development commission, uh, you know, and we said, well, there really isn't one. Um, we'll help you out if we can. We did have a little bit of flex and we made it happen, but it's not something that the Economic Institute is particularly well set up to do. It's not something that a lot of smaller cities are particularly well set up to do. Um, so what we want to do here is to have a better regional economic development planning and assistance capacity uh, to support the cities, to support the business community. Um, we believe that it should probably be some sort of partnership between the business community and uh, the regional governments. And I will just end with uh, the fact that we would love to see the process of ABAG and MTC merging going forward. Um, we think that will be quite helpful and uh, the uh, idea, we, what, what we want to inject into that conversation is the idea that this merged regional agency could have additional economic development capabilities to help uh, with economic development in the region. So that's a lot of information in a very short period of time, but we only have five minutes for questions, so I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know if we can go over, but uh, I'm going to wrap it up now and we can start the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have the questions. Again, from my right to left, please uh, take your name tag and put it up so that I can. Pat, you can start the questions. First of all, I thought we'd go to three o'clock. Yeah. yeah, I think it was 12 30 to 2 30. Oh, to 2 30. Okay, so we have more than five minutes for oh. questions. Um, all right. Well, you know, I can just go back over this more slowly. Yeah. All right. Let's get talking. Actually, you're. Um, I really appreciate you giving a presentation on this, and um, I've read it a couple of times, and um, I guess each time I read it, my blood boils a little bit more. Um, having worked for the federal government for over 40 years, I realized that uh, creating incentives for states and local governments to achieve goals that are national or statewide are really important. But taking away the legislative authority of governments, whether it's state or locals, um, is really um, goes counter to what our communities want. Communities want more locally based decisions, not something being put down on them. That's sort of the 
for me is the fundamental nature of the U.S. government. Um, you, you talk here about capping fees, and so I was really actually kind of surprised that the Bay Area Council or the Bay Area Institute um, didn't have a provision in here that something that we in the League of California Cities had talked about when we did uh, Prop 1A back in 2004, 2005, um, where the poison pill part of Prop 13, where as the change of ownership of houses, the property tax goes up commensurate with the actual sale. That's not true for um, commercial developments. And it's only when you have a true sale, a true exchange, does that property value go up and that's the property tax. I think one of the reasons why local governments have the need to raise fees in order to process applications throughout it is because we don't get the property tax that is really needed. So I was kind of curious, why didn't the Bay Area Council actually take that issue head on and instead of proposing necessarily a cap on sure. fees, why not the business community in a nine county bay area mm -hmm. stepping up to the plate and allowing when a property um, changes whether it's within a, uh, a corporation or an llc or mm -hmm. really pay for the value sure. the property tax for the value of that property that's my first question and now yeah the second one. yeah i mean let me just answer your last question. I mean, the other stuff, I mean, it's the input of the business community, if you have a perspective on it, that's fine. But the, the problem with split role, um, well, there are a bunch of them. One, it actually doesn't raise as much money as people think that it's going to raise, and there are projections that I can, you know, I point you to. So it's, it's not quite the fantasy that a lot of folks think that it is. But if the problem is the relative advantage of permitting and building commercial property versus residential property, so right now, it's in the interest of all cities to build all the commercial property and have their neighbor build all the housing. Right? If we change split roll, we actually make it even more financially advantageous for people to have commercial property versus residential property. So that actually takes the dynamic that we are concerned about and accentuates it rather than actually fixing the underlying set of incentives that all work against the production of housing. Basically, I mean, this is the opposite of what a tax system is supposed to do. In a tax system, you're supposed to tax the things you don't want to happen, largely. And here, our taxes, our regulations, our fees, you name it, all work against the uh, uh, economic well-being of the people in California. They work against the you know, potential economic growth that we have in the reason because they work against producing a supply of housing. Um, I guess I would differ with you because when I became an elected official for the first time 20 years ago in the city of Nevada, my city manager spent a lot of time telling me that uh, it costs more for the city to provide for the services for a household than for necessarily commercial development. So, you know, he, he always said that um, that we need to have more commercial development, but yet um, they, they pay their own share to help pay for the offset for the, the cost of having that housing. Um, nevertheless, uh, Nevada, we've done a really good job in achieving uh, our arena, the, the cycle before last, and, um, and hopefully we'll do more this next year. Well, and thank cycle. you. I want to help you out. I want to help out San Jose. I want to help out the cities that are seriously committed to building housing in spite of the fact that there's a collective action problem. But then, right? you, but then and I'd love to have this debate um, because frankly, um, there is a development that's happening right now in the city where the developer would rather take an in fee, whereas we have an inclusionary zoning requirement for 20%. Um, so we get that lower um, level uh, of income. Um, and so there's really not any economic advantage for companies or for the housing industry to do that lower threshold. They'd rather pay because it's cheaper than actually constructing it. So um, there's other concerns I have in some of your recommendations, like um, 
uh, taking away the loss of uh, local approval authority if we don't achieve the arena. Cities typically don't build the housing. And like with this last uh, arena cycle, all the cities not only had to approve the housing element, they actually had to rezone to be able to allow the building industry to not have to go through that cost of rezoning the property. Um, but yet not all developers are coming in and building it. So, it, so we are going to be, according to your recommendation, cities and counties are going to be penalized for the fact that um, the building industry may not want to build that particular housing in that location where it was rezoned. So. Yeah, I mean, point well taken. You would want to set it up in such a way that it did not have that unintended consequence. But the idea that all of this, you I mean, come on, we know what we're talking about, right? I mean, not all of the cities in the Bay Area are significantly committed to developing housing, and it's just the, you know, building industry association that won't build houses there, right? I mean, cities that, like, demonstrate a significant commitment towards trying to get the housing built in their communities are not the types of cities that would need to be held accountable. But there are, and we all know this, cities that have no intention whatsoever of building any more housing. And that creates a collective action problem in which they put their you know, neighbors at a, a disadvantage. So no, it would not be those folks that had a significant commitment to trying to get, to get as much housing built as they wanted. I'd love to have a panel discussion where there's community members that also want to talk about maintaining the quality of life. I guess I have a question for Miriam about this report. I'm not sure if she's still here again. Um, Miriam, um, I am concerned about a lot of the recommendations and policy statements in here that um, really impinge on local control. And um, uh, it's my understanding in reading this that this document will, quote, inform us as we go forward with Plan Barry 2017, but we're not necessarily going to be adopting uh, by right these recommendations in this report, correct? Oh, no, no, no. This, I mean, as Mike explained, this is input from the business community. We want input from the business community. This is what we have. Uh, well, there are some elements where, where we might agree, where you might agree. There are many other elements that will, where we will probably have a lot of disagreement. So this is an independent document, and it was not meant to be something that we all like. It was meant to be something that conveys the perspective of the business community. Yeah, and the other, you know, the other point there is that there was a sense that had there been more effort on the front end to incorporate the perspective of the business community that we, I mean, you know, you can sort of do things on the front end or do things on the back end. And there are obviously no guarantees associated with if you take more input on the front end, you won't have trouble on the back end. But the, the business voice, we're attempting to make sure that it is constructively engaged in this conversation at an earlier point so that we can have a, you know, a series of consensus recommendations to take into the, in consideration a number of different stakeholders and get more buy-in to the Plan Bay Area process. So this is all designed to support the Plan Bay Area process, but as I mentioned, I don't necessarily personally agree with all this. I hope you understand, like, my job here is to sort of be a spokesperson for this particular process so in response to your questions, I gave those answers, um, but that's the, the point of this process. And I guess I would contend that there's a missing voice too at the table, and that's the voice of the people. Um, my last question is to Miriam, is that is when we approve the people's places and uh, prosperity, on page um, 22 of that report, it, it talks about this report and the fact that it will help inform the development. It's been brought to my attention that some members of the community feel as though that by ABAG taking that position and approving people's places and things that we're actually approving this document. I want to make sure that you state on the record very clearly so that I can talk to my community that we're not approving the recommendations that are in this when we adopted the people, places, and prosperity.